In the spring of 2015, the art historian T.J. Clark presented a keynote address at Yale University, which sought to investigate the nature of 19th century romanticism. It drew together the work of three artists. One was French, Théodore Géricault, one Spanish, Francisco Goya, and one British, William Blake. All are canonical artists to be sure, but what Clark did with their work was unusual. From the outset, he drew together these artists via the work they were producing in a single year, 1820, seeking to explore the social historical underpinnings that would have led such disparate practitioners to produce what they did in this moment. He created a fascinating picture of this instant in history, for this happens to be the year that Géricault was likely painting his portraits of monomaniacs for the head of medicine at Salpetriere, while Goya was applying oil directly to the walls of his house near Madrid, creating works that would become known as the Black Paintings, and Blake was plumbing the depths of his psyche to produce this gem, the ghost of a flea, which could only have grown out of what Clark called, quote, the strange new ground of romanticism. I was in the audience that evening in April when he delivered this talk, and as it was unfolding, I couldn't help but think of the implications this kind of transcultural thinking could have. Now, Clark didn't address the methodological repercussions his cluster of paintings might possess, and he didn't venture into territory beyond the canon by including artists from other regions, but the talk got me thinking. What would have happened if Clark had used his sophisticated knowledge of political and class histories to expand this cluster? What about the maybe bizarre still lifes Raphael Peel was making in Philadelphia in 1820? Or the self-portraits made by the Russian artist Orest Kiprinsky while he was in Rome? Alexei Venetsyanov was also making gorgeous genre paintings at this time. He was a Moscow native, but by 1820, he had bought a village some 200 kilometers north of the city and was painting pastoral fantasies of serfdom, like the one I'm showing you on the slide here. While we're at it, maybe let's throw in another canonical artist. How about Caspar David Friedrich? He was working primarily in Dresden at this point. How do his landscapes look in the mix? Does this give us a better picture of romanticism or is this creating something else? As I was sitting there in the audience that day, rewriting Clark's talk in my head, creating what the art historian Richard Schiff channeling Benjamin once called constellations, I began to wonder what relation this all has to what the cultural theorist Pyotr Piotrowski called vertical art history that long dominant and hierarchical system that would mean I should actually reorder the artworks on the slide more like this, making those produced in the artistic mega centers huge and those from the peripheries really tiny by comparison. Doing so would highlight the ways that such a constellation was bound to reflect what has been called cultural asymmetry, a theory for how the art of the center determines the paradigm that the rest of the world supposedly imitates and adopts. Nonetheless, I wondered if such a constellation of artworks might produce what Piotrowski repeatedly yearned for, the kind of art history he called horizontal, and that it would figure geography as relational and build a historical narrative that was both polyphonic and multidimensional, all as a kind of critique of that old vertical model. I kept thinking about all this and experimenting. How far can you take such an exercise? How might it create an expansiveness in terms of looking at different media? Might there be other years that would make for even better horizontal case studies? I tested out 1915 next to see what a more modernist version might look like. I started by pairing Picasso's guitar and newspaper from 1915 with Malevich's Black Square, first exhibited in Petrograd in that year. Then I added an Egon Schiele print to the mix in order to finally start branching out in terms of media. And then I added Mondrian, who was working in an artist's colony in North Holland in 1915. 
But even with all this avant-garde abstraction, I remembered that in New York, Ashcan artists like John Sloan were still painting works like the Jitney in this year, which you see on the slide now. And come to think of it, as hard as it is to believe, Monet was still painting his water lilies in Giverny in 1915. And to add yet another artist from my Russian area of expertise, if you haven't guessed already that Russia is what I work on, how about Ilya Repin? He was completing a very traditional realist portrait of the actor Pavel Samoylov in Finland by this moment. So no matter how much I added, I could see that the map was still not complete, maybe never going to be complete. Huge sections of the world and its creative practice are missing from my attempts at horizontal art history. I tried to think what I could add from Japan, India, Africa, but I kept realizing that I just lack the expertise. Diego Rivera came to mind for Latin America. This is what he was making in 1915, but he wasn't in his native Mexico. He was in Paris, complicating the map that I was creating. There were other problems too. This map, as you can see, is too painting heavy, and it's a map constructed almost entirely from works made by privileged white men. I started to think this was all in fact becoming something of a failure, that trying to create a horizontal art history isn't really possible. But certain things did start to arise from these experiments and I wanna focus on those today. All this started to make me think differently as a historian. It made me reflect on what we're doing when we try to revive the past and about how much one might sink into the period they're studying. It made me realize the power of the single moment, of all that it can contain. And it made me almost hyper aware of how limited our periodizations according to style really are. I actually started to feel a little bit like I imagine Abby Varberg once did when he was creating this Mnemosyne Atlas. It started to feel like this might actually be a method, one that was transcultural and intra-historical, and one that might have implications not just in terms of my own research, but in pedagogy as well. It was at this point that I devised a course which I hoped would reinscribe a sense of the complexity of the romantic moment in history. And I'm showing you the, the course Moodle page, the system that we use at UL Lafayette. Um, Essentially, I wanted to create a narrative which was pluralistic, that was non-hierarchical, one that preserved varied subjectivities, all elements that Piotrowski had described as crucial to his project of horizontal art history. I called this course the Single Year Seminar, and I taught it as an upper level undergraduate class devoted entirely to creative production in that same year that Clark had focused on, 1820. We progressed in this class week by week through all of the artists I've already mentioned, reading deeply on each cultural context and maker, but also discussing the, uh, the effectiveness of the method itself, acting as self-conscious producers of historical narratives, analyzing the patterns we saw emerging. As you can see from this, I'll admit, much pared down schema of the syllabus, I also made the course really interdisciplinary. We, we read uh, Balzac and Byron and Hegel. We listened to Beethoven and Schubert traversing the creative world from Peel's Philadelphia to Friedrich's Dresden to Venetianov's Little Russian Village. There was no textbook, just a kind of hodgepodge of readings that I gleaned from a variety of fields. And in the end, we discussed romanticism as the overarching style of the moment, very little in fact. Looking back on it, I think the course succeeded in several ways. Something about the method did indeed relativize the history of Western art. It deconstructed traditional geographical categories, and it showed that even the traditional centers of production, Paris, London, Berlin, they were actually quite heterogeneous even in one single moment. But the course failed in ways that went deep. Focusing on a single year didn't automatically grow context, what Norman Bryson has referred to as the all-important framing that has to be brought to bear on art. 
The course also failed to be free of geographical hierarchies in the way that I had hoped. Russian and American artists especially still seemed like outliers to the students, even if they liked their work more than that of Jericho and Friedrich. At this point, I did what I think we all do or we often do when we get stuck as teachers and as researchers. I went back to doing more reading and in particular, I dived more deeply into the work of Piotrowski, the, the source of all this for me in addition to Clark. What I realized first was that there didn't seem to be a term for this kind of work beyond the general horizontal art history. Others had undertaken similar projects, but no single term for the method has become established. I usually refer to it as the intrahistorical method, um, though I think a more accurate expression would be something like ooh, transcultural intervality, though I realize this is a very, very clunky way of describing what I'm doing. Maybe we need to begin devising a new technical language for these new methodological processes. I thought of the word synchronotechnical, which I know is not also not great in terms of rolling off of the tongue. It's a word based on Greek roots, syn meaning with or same, chronos for time and techne for art. But do we really need more terms in art history? Piotrowski himself got close to exploring such a practice without naming it as a possible mode within horizontal art history. In 1999, he issued a call for altered modes of curatorial organization, stating that, quote, one of them could be, for example, a horizontal comparison around particular key dates in both the history of art and politics, such as 1956, 1968 through 70, 1980. Such critical studies would provide a critical approach to the question of similarities and differences between the center and margins, but also between many geographical margins themselves, end quote. But then he turned to the dangers inherent in such methods, most notably that they stand to neutralize spatial relations and mask the character of place. Nonetheless, one can see the method beginning to emerge, particularly in the museum world. There have been a number of recent exhibitions with a single year as their focus. A good case in point is the recent Picasso uh, show, which was held at the Tate Modern and focused on the year 1932. But it, many of you will know, was widely panned by critics for reinforcing the dominant tendencies of vertical art history. It maintained discourses of power as opposed to deconstructing them. Perhaps the best example of this synchronotechnical method that I'm describing can be seen in the textbook Art Since 1900. Written by five prominent art historians associated with the October Quarterly, the two volume study was published first in 2004 and is now in its third edition. Popularly used for a number of courses, Art Since 1900 is arranged by dated entries which proceed chronologically from 1900 to the present. In the preface, the co-authors explain their system thus, quote, this book is organized as a succession of important events, each keyed to an appropriate date, like the pieces of a large puzzle that can be transformed into a great variety of images, its 122 entries can also be arranged in different ways." End quote. The authors then explain the range of histories that can be constructed as a result of this organization by single years. One can track narratives constructed along national lives, lines, excuse me, or alternatively, one might trace transnational developments. A third approach would be to group entries according to thematic concerns. According to the authors, the years were chosen because they represent a key moment in the history of 20th and 21st century art. It might be the creation of a groundbreaking work, the publication of a seminal text, the opening of a crucial exhibition or another significant event. This causes certain years to appear in multiple. For instance, there are two entries for the years 1900, 1916, 1917, and 1925 to, to name but a few. Only occasionally do the authors utilize the single year format to explore art practice in multiple geographies, though. Piotrowski, interestingly, praised the textbook, calling it, quote, definitively one of the best available overviews of 20th century art and an excellent academic textbook virtually indispensable, end quote. 
But he also recognized that it, quote, does not revise the tacit assumptions of modernist artistic geography. By refusing to deconstruct the relations between the center and the periphery, art since 1900 maintains the status quo hierarchy of vertical art history. Piotrowski admitted that conducting a critique of the vertical program would not be easy, but his hope remained throughout his writings that another paradigm might still be established. So knowing all this, where do we go from here? If art since 1900 failed to create a pluralistic narrative, as did my course on 1820 and exhibitions like the one at the Tate only reinforcing vertical paradigms, then what is the way forward? In an essay on methods and meaning in modern Eastern European art from 2002, the art historian Stephen Monsbach argued for a renewed open-mindedness and methodological inventiveness in our field. If we could grasp art within a historically sensitive matrix, he claimed, then we might be rewarded with a richer and more complex modernism. I couldn't agree with him more. But to create such a multivalent geography, I think we must take very seriously our role as teachers, not just researchers, creating the new generation of art historians in our classes right now. We need a textbook that does better than art since 1900. And I think writing one that is truly horizontal will require a team of authors that do not all come from the same perspective. My map stalled because I'm a Russian art specialist who also knows the Western European and American canon well. But I needed the mind of a Latin Americanist and an East Asian specialist and an Africanist. We must bond together and create scholarly texts that speak not just to each other, but to students. And we must make these books uh, affordably priced and use them, actually use them, not just talk about using them in the classes that we teach. I can imagine a survey of art that would use this new textbook and rely on the synchronous technical method I've described here to bring space and time, histor history and geography together at long last. It would begin as surveys often do with the Renaissance. Sure, it's fine. It would describe the usual masterworks, Michelangelo's David, let's say. But then it would discuss that artwork in tandem with this Benin ivory mask created in Nigeria also in the 16th century. Then it would explore, let's say, Ming dynasty paintings like this one and Russian icons and this remarkable Virgin of Guadalupe all produced in the same 16th century moment. If students who have never taken an art history class get hooked on the idea of horizontal art history from the beginning, if they never see the old vertical hierarchical model, then we might create a discipline that finally treats all places as equal, that puts the experience of the individual, the local, the personal, and the universal at the forefront. In the end, it's a romantic idea. So maybe it was right that it began as a dream I conjured while listening to a talk on romanticism. No movement was ever more mythical, more characterized by madness, and therefore utterly a thing of modernism. Thank you.